Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. The claims were enormous. For strange tasting tonics that promised to cure all sorts of ailments. People were desperate for these things, much the way they are for diet drugs or diet pills today. But what were the secret ingredients in these elixirs that sufferers unaware eagerly swallowed? What was in them was often cocaine, uh, sometimes mercury, um, and also a lot of alcohol. 19th century consumers wanted badly to believe in the curative power of these bizarre remedies. And medicine makers were ready to sell them just about anything to cure what ailed them. Join us as we uncover the hidden truths behind patent medicines, potions, or poisons. Summer, 1950, an imposing parade of trucks advertising an elixir called Hadacol marches into American cities in the South. Every night, some 10,000 fans bring their admission fee, one Hadacol box top, to see the Hadacol Goodwill Caravan Show. It features some of the biggest names in the entertainment business. Along with a brash master of ceremonies, Louisiana State Senator Dudley LeBlanc. He has designed the gargantuan medicine show to promote the Hadacol message far and wide. The idea was always it's going to improve your sex life. Uh, it's going to put the uh, zip back in grandpa and grandma. And it, they'd show, you know, elderly people uh, just full of vim, vigor, and vitality after drinking Hadacol. Hadacol, fishy smelling and foul tasting, is Dudley LeBlanc's brainchild. In the early 1940s, the former door-to-door -door salesman begins concocting the potion in backyard barrels to cure his arthritis. It worked, he says. In addition, LeBlanc claims the mixture of honey, vitamins, minerals, and a stiff shot of alcohol is the antidote for everything from diabetes to obesity to a frigid wife. It was supposed to fix almost everything. And of course, it, uh, it could give you quite a buzz on. In fact, the American Medical Association warns against imbibing the 12% alcohol elixir. In spite of this, or perhaps because of it, the public devours had a call at $3.50 a bottle. In 1950, gross sales for LeBlanc's concoction shoot up beyond $20 million several times more than the next best-selling over-the-counter drug, aspirin. He uh, made a lot of money very fast and spent a lot of money. Uh, he was asked once, so what was Hanukkah good for? He said Hanukkah was good for $5 million last year. Over time, the elixir and its colorful promoter fade into Southern folklore. And Hadacol, with its false promise as the perfect cure-all, becomes a descendant of a long line of mythical cures that make up the history of patent medicines. The first patent medicines in North America are from England, having come over with the first settlers. The term comes from the days when European royalty granted patents to their favorite medicine makers. But most aren't actually patented. In early America, no laws govern these so-called patent medicines, which are really non-prescription remedies made of secret ingredients. Their labels are significant, so they're trademarked by the manufacturers. What they cared about was, in fact, the, uh, the shape of the bottles, the labels, the name. And that's, uh, that's what was important to them, and that's what drew sort of a brand loyalty. Self-medication for every ill and complaint is a way of life that few colonials question. English remedies were very popular for all kinds of ailments, anything from liver ailments and female complaints and weaknesses, pills for what they called dyspepsia, stomach problems, those sorts of things. 
Colonials, like their British cousins, believe that the worse a medicine tastes, the more effective the cure. Cotton Mather, an influential Puritan leader, recommends the medicinal properties of one remedy made of cow dung and urine. Mather, of course, is no doctor, but since the medical profession isn't much of a profession, just about anybody can recommend a cure. People didn't really trust doctors. Uh, the state of medical education was fairly primitive. There really, it didn't take a whole lot to be a doctor. You could go out and hang your shingle up, and it wasn't uh, a big deal. Sometimes druggists were doctors, barbers were doctors. American-made patent medicines begin to compete successfully with British ones as a made-in-America fervor follows the Revolutionary War. Labels would promise that this is all American ingredients, and there was a you know a real patriotic feeling that if you bought American, somehow it would be better, more uh, homemade, more more pure, whatever. Competition heats up among medicine makers. Beginning in the 1820s, Americans find drugstore shelves brimming with American-made patent medicines. One of the most popular products is concocted by a Philadelphia bookbinder, William Swain. When ill, he consults a doctor who gives him some medicine. Impressed with the remedy's curative powers, Swain secures the formula from his doctor and in 1820 begins to manufacture it. He christens his elixir with a powerful name, panacea, a Greek word meaning all healing. As its symbol, Swain selects Hercules slaying the many-headed Hydra. At the high price of $2 a bottle, the potent panacea is marketed to fight the many evil faces of disease, including cancer, rheumatism, gout, hepatitis, and the early stages of syphilis. It's sort of a good example of the use of hyperbole in patent medicines. Some of them swore that they would cure up to 36 or even 100 different ailments, and so you could sort of pick something and decide that that was your, that was your medicine. Patient testimonials proclaim panacea victorious in curing disease. It's even endorsed by prominent physicians. The elixir is a huge seller, but its sweeping claims prompt the Philadelphia Medical Society in 1827 to launch an investigation. William Swain was a real quack. Uh, he made a, a sarsaparilla that was doped up with mercury and uh, made a better tasting by oil of wintergreen. And he, he always denied that there was any mercury in his medicine until it was finally proved that this was a total, total lie. In a 37-page attack, the Medical Society concludes that panacea may have been responsible for several patient deaths and is neither effective nor safe. However, criticism doesn't deter William Swaim's rise to wealth. By mid-19th century, he's worth half a million dollars, a huge sum at the time. In the 19th century, increasing numbers of Americans come to depend on patent medicines, and on occasion, some actually work, sort of. Probably the placebo effect, you know, kicked in a lot. You know, you start to feel better because you think you're going to feel better. Many of these patent medicines contain herbs that often have a laxative or diuretic effect. So customers believe they're actually curing something even if it isn't medically helpful. But others, although marketed with sweet, cheerful ads, may pose some danger to customers. In 1885, an Atlanta pharmacist, John Pemberton, begins to adapt a popular import, Vin Mariani, a compound of wine and cocoa leaves, the source of cocaine. Pemberton adds cola nut, an herbal substance containing caffeine, and he announces the invention of a new health tonic, Pemberton's French wine coca. You would go into the pharmacy, and here was friendly Mr. Pemberton, the uh, local pharmacist in Atlanta in the corner store. And you'd sit down and you order, and you felt suddenly just great.
One year later, under pressure by a local prohibition ordinance, Pemberton substitutes sugar syrup for wine, keeps the coca leaves, and adds carbonated water. He names the new beverage Coca-Cola. And the result was what was called a, a temperance tonic, or a Sunday soda. First, uh, Coca-Cola was advertised as a brain tonic. It cleared the mind, uh, made you, your mind stronger. At the time, the addictive nature of coca leaves is not understood. For 18 years, the plant continues as a flavoring ingredient of Coca-Cola. In 1903, reformers question its use, and it's removed from the drink, though the name sticks. In the 19th century, there is considerable ignorance about some narcotics, such as cocaine. Drug addiction isn't understood or even recognized as a serious vice. Narcotics and alcohol are common ingredients in many patent medicines, so it's not surprising that people taking such remedies feel their illnesses are cured. People often just sort of felt good when they took them and they thought, well, you know, I felt really lousy six hours ago, and now I really feel pretty good. So as far as they were concerned, it was as good as doing anything else. Products sold as general fortifying medicines have cocaine in them. Even many baby medicines contain cocaine, morphine, and chloroform. Powders for relieving nasal congestion are often filled with cocaine. Headache powders sometimes use acetanilid, a poison derived from coal tar that, when inhaled, can cause death. And medicines for so-called female complaints rely heavily on alcohol for their effect. There are no laws forcing manufacturers to list ingredients or to assure the public a product is safe. In the hands of an unsophisticated public, these preparations sometimes have disastrous results. At best, they were wasting their money. At worst, they could, they could possibly um, become alcoholics unintentionally. Um, or they could actually suffer from some real addictions, since so many of these things had cocaine and other narcotics. One of the worst offenders is a patent medicine called bitters. A man named David Hostetter markets the most successful bitters preparation. Failing in his efforts to strike it rich during the 1849 California Gold Rush, Hostetter returns to his Pennsylvania home. Working for some railroad builders, Hostetter meets a man with some money and convinces him to invest in marketing a patent medicine his father had cooked up years before. The arrival of Hostetter's celebrated stomach bitters in 1853 is fortuitous. During the 1850s, temperance crusaders are winning some victories. Before the decade's end, several states enact prohibition laws. Bitters, being nominally a medicine, could be taken by people who subscribed to the temperance movement who didn't believe in drinking. I mean, Grandma could take a big spoonful of jaundice bitters in the evening and improve her digestion. And uh, it had uh, probably a laxative effect, as most of the bitters did, and uh, feel she was uh, doing herself some good from a health standpoint uh, and wasn't taking a drink. During the second half of the 19th century, America develops a mighty thirst for Hostetters and other bitters that contain medicinal tasting herbs mixed with lots of alcohol, sometimes 40% or more, the equivalent of 80 proof whiskey. And they were really popular with women, um, even when there were saloons so-called respectable women were not supposed to go to them. And so the way women drank was they stayed home and said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm feeling poorly today. I'll have to have some bitters, and they would just, you know, hit the bottle that way. The secret formula for Hostetter's bitters isn't revealed until 1883, when a Department of Agriculture chemist finds that the product contains 4% herbs, 52% water, and 44% alcohol. Hostetters is regularly dispensed from saloons across the country where patrons enjoy its whopping alcoholic content. 
It proves to be a potent formula in another way. Between 1862 and 1883, sales of the celebrated stomach bitters average $1 million a year. When David Hostetter dies in 1888, he leaves a fortune of some $18 million. If patent medicines don't deliver to the consumer all they promise, they certainly do bestow fortunes to some inventors and manufacturers. Before the 1870s, most American patent medicines are local phenomena. But by the late 19th century, medicine makers reach a market that covers a continent thanks to the new transcontinental railroad, lower postal rates, and an expanded popular daily press. Advertising copy in a variety of forms blankets the U.S. You could find this stuff everywhere. So if you opened up a, an almanac or a newspaper, there were, there were pages and pages of advertising for these patent medicines. When you have a sea of products, uh, none of them uh, with any merit, uh, the only difference between them is their advertising. Advertising was the whole game. As more and more potions glut the market, Medicine makers begin to look for gimmicks that grab the consumer's attention. They use certain fashionable key words such as vegetable or names of vegetables and fruits to promote the notion that the product is simple, homemade, and unadulterated. In testimonials, satisfied customers describe how a remedy cures their suffering. Medicines are popularly advertised as safe and fast-acting. Consumers' fears of death or disease are highlighted. Claims can never be too far-fetched or overblown. And anything with the word Indian is a winner. Many of the uh, herbal medicines uh, in particular used an association with primitive or foreign peoples to give their medicine an exotic uh, mystique. And, of course, the favorite one was the American Indian, who was presumed to know about every plant that grew. Uh, you could put an Indian on anything, and it would sell. Professional advertising men, however, are beaten at their own game by a Lynn, Massachusetts housewife, Lydia E. Pinkham, who conceives one of the most successful ad campaigns of the era. Growing up, Young Lydia is drawn to alternative medical theories, such as reliance on botanic preparations, and learns to make homemade remedies for various ills. In the 1870s, she is busy concocting a brew for neighbors. Naming it Vegetable Compound, Lydia claims that the tonic for female complaints and weaknesses relieves cramps and brightens the spirit which no doubt are aided by the compound's 20% alcohol content. One day, two strangers come to her door asking about the tonic. They actually were willing to pay money for it, and so the family, who was uh, suffering at the time financially, got the idea that they would actually start, could start selling this stuff, which is what they did. Lydia's son, in a stroke of genius, dreams up the compound's all-important trademark, his mother's face. A $60 ad in a Boston newspaper featuring Lydia Pinkham's grandmotherly countenance startles readers who are not used to seeing female portraits inside the daily. Continued ads in papers across the country make Lydia's the best-known female face in America. With Lydia's picture on every package of vegetable compound, sales boom. She exuded trust. People could write in and ask for advice, uh, ask Mrs. Pinkham. It's Lydia's most clever marketing ploy, an invitation to women who are embarrassed talking to male doctors to write to her for medical as well as non-medical advice. Letters pour in and Lydia personally answers each one. 
She was appealing to women who didn't feel comfortable talking to their doctors, for the most part we're talking about men, about female complaints, about menstrual cramps and those sorts of things. And so it was kind of a, a bonding there. Lydia's slogan was, uh, men just don't understand. Uh, that it was a very personal kind of advertising that she used, woman to woman. By the time of Lydia's death in 1883, the tonic is bringing in $300,000 a year and will remain a bestseller for years to come. Most patent medicines are sold in pharmacies, but some manufacturers, known as pitchmen, prefer to meet their customers face to face. In the mid-19th century, William Doc Rockefeller, the father of future Standard Oil mogul John D. Rockefeller, is roaming the Midwest, bringing entertainment and elixirs to backwoods towns. He uses his talents as a hypnotist to attract a crowd. Next, he begins to pitch bottled herbs for the then stupendous sum of $25, a cure, claims Doc, for cancer. <laughs> Beginning in the 1880s, pitch men like Rockefeller begin teaming up with entertainers to produce medicine shows. Barnstorming the country, they sell a variety of potions that eventually are lumped together under one label, snake oil. The shows have their origins in 17th century Europe with mountebanks, phony doctors who pull teeth and perform magic and comedy. They were kind of allied to the Commedia de Arte performers who went around and performed in piazzas and all kinds of public spaces and often would have amulets and cures. Part circus-style entertainment and part sales pitch, American traveling medicine shows are one of the most colorful and successful gimmicks used to sell patent medicines even into the 20th century. They brought a lot of color and excitement to small towns of people who lived on farms who didn't have a lot to do. They consisted of not just a pitch for medication, but also certain kinds of uh, entertainment acts. There would be a strong man who would do feats of strength. There would be a singer. There would be a couple dancers. Then the doctor, the title was usually self-conferred, would come out, make a speech, say, you know, you might be feeling a little poorly today, or something may have been bothering you for quite a long time. I just happen to have exactly what you need. The most crowd-pleasing acts turn out to be those of so-called Indian medicine men whom non-natives believe are imbued with magical knowledge of botanical medicines. In 1881, a Connecticut Yankee, John Healy, and a Texan, Charles Bigelow, both veteran patent medicine salesmen, join forces and dream up a spectacle that in terms of size and message is the grandest, most daring medicine show of all. They call it the Kickapoo Indian Medicine Company and sell Kickapoo Indian Sagwa, an alcohol-laced cure for stomach aches and rheumatism. Sagwa was the most well-known product of the Kickapoo uh, company, and it was just a made-up name that the uh, Caucasian founders of the company just thought sounded like something Indians would say. And it was a foul-tasting liquid with lots of bizarre ingredients uh, and, and some herbs and things like that. In the 1880s, Healy and Bigelow hire Native Americans by the hundreds, none of them real Kickapoo, to join some 100 touring companies selling Sagwa and other Kickapoo products throughout rural America. During the show, an Indian delivers an impassioned oration that describes the dramatic origin of the remedy. It has, he says, saved countless Indian lives and after great sacrifice, will be offered to audience members. About $4,000 worth of Kickapoo Indian Sagwa is sold every week. After World War I, the pervasive medicine show pitch man with his snake oil turns up as a comedic subject in silent movies. In fact, during this time, medicine shows begin to lose public appeal as rural areas become less culturally isolated and radio and moving pictures offer competitive amusements.
In the late 19th century, American patent medicines are a multi-million dollar business. During the past 100 years, the number of patent medicines made in the U.S. has increased from a dozen to about 30,000. Manufacturers are free to mix whatever they want and promote it however they wish. We were in the era of laissez-faire. Uh, not just the buyer beware, but businessmen should be able to do their own thing without government intervention or anybody telling them what to do. That was a, really the predominant social philosophy here. And that left a wide open field for quacks. The public is bombarded constantly by patent medicine advertising that uses every trick in the book to sell a product. Many Americans, in an effort to cure their illnesses through self-medication, are addicted to patent medicines with concealed contents of narcotics and alcohol. Even though about half the states by 1895 have passed food and drug laws, they aren't effective. There were some state laws that regulated patent medicines, but once you sold your ingredients or your, your medicine uh, over the state lines, it really had no effect. In the early 1900s, Norman Hapgood, the editor of Collier's Magazine, is scrutinizing his publication's ads. Several for patent medicine stand out. Affronted by what he feels are fraudulent claims, Hapgood orders the ads removed and then sets out to find a reporter capable of writing a hard-hitting, full-scale expose of medical quackery. The man he chooses is 34-year-old Samuel Hopkins Adams. An investigative journalist, Adams is part of a group of magazine writers known at the time as muckrakers, who are railing against big business monopolies like the patent medicine industry and stirring up public outrage. And the outrage was, hey, they're selling whiskey as medicine. They're selling drugs as medicines. Adams has done sleuthing as a crime reporter and has written articles on medical developments. As a muckraker, he is dedicated to factual accuracy and has a zeal for improving the lot of mankind. Adams begins by gathering and studying examples of patent medicine advertising. He buys the medicines advertised and sends them for analysis to Dr. Harvey Wiley, the chief chemist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In October 1905, the first chapter of Adams' investigative series, The Great American Fraud, appears in Collier's. Gullible America, Adams begins, will spend this year some 75 millions of dollars in the purchase of patent medicines. In consideration of this sum, it will swallow huge quantities of alcohol, an appalling amount of opiates and narcotics, a wide assortment of varied drugs ranging from powerful and dangerous heart depressants to insidious liver stimulants, and far in excess of all other ingredients, undiluted fraud. These were the secret ingredients that, for the first time, it came out. Uh, he talked about the dangers of advertising and the, uh, the way people were duped. Um, he blamed the media, much the way we blame the media today for advertising. Over the next five months, Adam's series exposes the false advertising of the patent medicine industry, the snake oil salesmen who prey on patients with incurable diseases and some 260 quack cures with either ineffective or potentially dangerous ingredients. The Proprietary Association of America, the lobbying arm for the patent medicine industry formed in 1881, strongly voices its objections. But Samuel Hopkins Adams' call for the enactment of a national law to curb patent medicine abuses picks up steam. In the 25 years preceding, there'd been over 100 bills uh, proposed to do this same sort of thing, only they could never generate the public support that the Adams article finally generated. At the same time, the public is learning about the filthy conditions of America's meatpacking industry through another muckraker, Upton Sinclair. People were saying, my gosh, is that what's in my hot dogs? Adams is joined in his campaign by an influential voice, Harvey Washington Wiley. He was a man who was very highly respected 
because of his capability and his dedication to duty. He'd been a Civil War veteran. He was a chief chemist since around, I think, early 1880s. Uh, he was really seen as a real protector of the public health. Raised in an evangelical home, Wiley shares with Adams a sense of righteousness. He's offended by fraud and inveighs against food adulterers as economic cheats. Food was really his area, but his endorsement of the uh, medicinal aspect of the law uh, probably went a long way to help it get passed. Wiley becomes the main champion in the fight for a national law. On June 30th, 1906, he sees his efforts pay off as President Theodore Roosevelt signs the Pure Food and Drugs Act. It becomes known as the Wiley Law. And although it's a major step in the right direction, it's basically a labeling law requiring manufacturers to list the presence and amount of certain dangerous drugs, such as alcohol, opiates, and acetanilid. It got rid of what we call the secret remedy. You had to tell what was in it. It didn't mean that it was illegal to sell it. It was still legal to sell these things. But now people knew what was in it. Time reveals serious shortcomings in the law, but to be sure, changes are made in patent medicines. A number of uh, medicine manufacturers are beginning to say, our product contains no opium, our product contains uh, no harmful narcotics, because the dangers of these medicines uh, were so widely known by that time. In fact, there is a marked reduction in the narcotic and alcoholic content of patent medicines. Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup is modified, first to cut down on the percentage of morphine present, then to eliminate it altogether. Hostetter's bitters reduces its alcohol from 44 to 25 percent. As a result, many patent medicines experience a decline in sales, and some go out of business altogether. But others simply tone down their claims and begin marketing themselves as a symptomatic remedy rather than a cure-all. They embrace the Pure Food and Drug Act as their own, using it to legitimize themselves. This uh, law really, uh, although it didn't uh, have its effect overnight, uh, marked the end of the high point of what we call patent medicines. Still, safety is a big issue in the late 1920s as thousands of Americans continue to suffer severe reactions to over-the-counter medicines. It takes a mass-scale tragedy in 1937 to get a new federal drug law passed. Elixir of sulfonilamide hits the market. Not a patent medicine, it's one of the first-generation sulfa drugs to fight infection. By October, doctors across America begin to report cases of poisoning. It turns out that the elixir contains a solvent similar to antifreeze, and 107 people who take the medicine end up dead, most of them children. One year later, in 1938, President Franklin Roosevelt signs the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act making it mandatory that a product be proven safe before reaching the market. In 1962, the act is revised. Drugs must not only be safe, but effective as well. Some things don't change. That's certainly the case with the public's desire to self-medicate using over-the-counter remedies. And the reasons for doing so aren't all that different than they were in the days when William Swaim's panacea was popular. People with serious diseases fear some of the uh, main techniques of, uh, of orthodox medicine. Uh, surgery, which of course can be very invasive. Uh, chemotherapy scares a lot of people. Radiation therapy scares a lot of people. At the same time, I think it's human nature to look for a shortcut and look for a, sh a quick cure. While some medicines continue to offer relief from old standby afflictions, headaches, coughs, and stress, an array of modern products now offers to treat new in ailments. I would say that the modern patent medicines are things like diet remedies and, and creams that are supposed to get rid of wrinkles and whatever. 
we're not concerned with liver ailments, uh, we're not concerned with bilious pills, but we, we are concerned with looking older and we want to feel good. Today's smorgasbord of products, like those over 100 years ago, often assures the user that their safety derives from natural ingredients. It's a claim that troubles some healthcare professionals. Natural does not mean safe. Uh, cyanide is uh, natural. You can get it from uh, seeds of various fruits. Uh, tobacco is natural, but you can get nicotine uh, poisoning. So the word natural is just a good uh, sales word. And you see it on uh, a variety of ads for all kinds of things. Uh, drinking your own urine uh, could be considered natural, but it's not advisable. But natural products, such as the increasingly popular herbal dietary supplements, do have their supporters. The natural medicines have less side effects. Uh, have been, many of them have been plants on the planet for a very long time and used in human consumption, so there is a track record. One of the most controversial natural remedies in recent times was developed in 1949 by Ernst Krebs, Jr., a San Francisco biochemist. He synthesizes a substance from apricot pits and names it Laetril, first hailing it as a cancer cure and later as a cancer preventive. By the late 1970s, Laetril's popularity is substantial. People will do anything if they believe that they have cancer. This made the opportunity for Laetril, uh, which was touted half as a medicine, half as a, a health food. And the appeal fit into a, a boom in natural medicine, plant remedies, uh, and uh, diet, attention to diets by the general public. Many medical professionals weigh in strongly against Laetril, calling it at best ineffective, at worst, lethal. It has a form of cyanide in it. It can be a, a fatal source of, of cyanide poisoning, and that did happen. Although the federal government bans its interstate shipping, cancer sufferers fight for their right to use the apricot pit derivative. The whole Laetril campaign really became a, a political matter in a sense. Uh, issues of states' rights and freedom of speech were used to bolster the sale of this disastrous medicine. By 1977, treatment of cancer with Laetril is illegal in California and New York, so many patients flee south of the border to clinics in Tijuana, Mexico, where Laetril can be purchased legally. Among the patients is actor Steve McQueen. In 1980, he gives a glowing report of the treatment, but dies shortly afterward. The Laetril movement runs out of steam in the wake of McQueen's death. Studies by the National Cancer Institute show Laetril to be completely ineffective in fighting cancer. It can still be purchased. I don't think it's used as much today because we have other modern products that are marketed. The newest tool to help separate medical fact from fiction is the internet. Well, I think the internet uh, is a very, very good thing. The internet makes it possible for anybody, anywhere, to get accurate health information if they just know where to look. Just as it did in an earlier time when far out claims by patent medicine advertisers were ubiquitous, widespread access to so much information can pose dangers. Every illness has some bizarre sites. And the one thing that you have to do is to make sure that if you get that information from uh, a site that you find a way to verify it, talk it over with your physician, uh, don't just go out and act on it. A few old time remedies can still be purchased. In the 1970s, the Federal Trade Commission forced Carter's Little Liver Pills, a constipation and headache remedy, to drop the word liver saying it was a false claim. And one of the most famous patent medicines of all is alive and well, albeit with a major makeover. 
Inside this new tamper-resistant bottle are herbal tablets still recommended for female complaints by the smiling face of none other than Lydia E. Pinkham. I think Lydia, without having the benefit of the science today, knew uh, uh, what herbs to choose from clinical perspective and good historical herbal knowledge to put a formula together that worked. And uh, I think Lydia uh, will be validated by uh, our ongoing science and choosing some of the herbs that she did. With self-medication as popular as ever, some healthcare professionals warn against overdoing it. Well, self-medication is really part of life. I mean, we all uh, handle our little ups and downs and aches and pains, but when it delays people getting proper care for diseases that are time dependent, that's a bad thing. So it, it's, it's one of those balances in life. It's not a totally evil thing. It's a reality that has to be kept within uh, reasonable limits. Today, we may look back and laugh at the potions that promised to cure our ancestors' dyspepsia and liver ailments. Yet during the heyday of patent medicines, remedies like Hostetter's Bitters and Kickapoo Indian Sagwa were as much a part of the American household medicine cabinet as aspirin is today. Self-medication has a long history, one that is very much alive today.